Plum Island, where the U.S. government's Animal Disease Center is located, right off Long Island, has long been shrouded in controversy and mystery. Michael Carroll has written a book about it. Michael Carroll, how did the Plum Island facility get its start? Uh, well, the genesis of Plum Island, actually, uh, to understand that, you have to go over to Nazi Germany. Uh, the head of the um, biological warfare effort in World War II for Germany was a doctor by the name of Eric Traub. Eric Traub uh, had his own island, uh, offshore island, off the city of Mecklenburg called Insel Reims. And on that island, he was doing all kinds of biological um, testing with viruses and bacteria. It was really the epicenter of Nazi Germany's germ warfare effort. After World War II, we got our hands on Traub. We uh, smuggled him into the United States under uh, top secret project paperclip uh, to import all the German scientific talent into the United States. And uh, he was sort of given the task of building a laboratory, and his idea was to sort of replicate Insel Reims and an offshore uh, germ warfare laboratory, and that's what uh, Plum Island ultimately became. Now, you talked about testing of biological agents on Insel Reims. Did they do anything more than testing during World War II, the Nazis? They did. I mean, they had a full-scale stage of their goal was to figure out ways to wipe out the enemy food supply and to decimate the people as well. Their goal uh, was to, and Traub ran these tests where he had animals, reindeer and cattle penned up on these uh, fields with, on what they called in the documents the Eastern Front, which of course was occupied Russia. And they would have Luftwaffe bombers going over these fields uh, using the dispersion devices, spraying these mists of aerosol uh, viruses and bacteria um, into these pens of animals to see what would happen. Traub ran these things. He also went on these exploration uh, ordered by Himmler to go to Turkey at least twice to go pick up virulent strains of of, uh, of viruses and, and some bacteria to bring back to this offshore laboratory. So he's brought here under Project Paperclip, this Dr. Traub, and according to your research, uh, he is sort of the father of Plum Island. He really is. I mean, there's really no other. It's interesting, you know. You know the people of the East End of Long Island were uh, in the 19, early early 1950s were sold a bill of goods. They were told that the Department of Agriculture was putting together this animal lab and it was going to protect uh, farm workers and uh, uh, farm animals and and the nation's food supply. And while part of that's true, the part that they didn't uh, talk about, the the glaring omission, was that its goal also simultaneously was to be an a offensive germ warfare laboratory where they were going to work on weaponizing viruses and bacteria for use offensively in the now emerging Cold War against the, uh, you know, the new Sino-Soviet threat that had occurred. Newsday did a, oh, was a front page story uh, a number of years ago, uh, documents out of Fort Detrick, speaking of Plum Island's original mission under the Army was to develop agents uh, that would be used against livestock of the now former Soviet Union. That's right. I mean, there's all kinds of declassified materials at the National Archives and Records Administration where I did this research, and it shows very clearly that they were very interested in this as a means of waging war in a, in, in a Cold War period. They had information tabulated showing how much uh, calories uh, were needed to, uh, you know, to sustain a soldier, to sustain a, you know, a Chinese farm worker, and what they would need to, to reduce to bring down to a starvation level. And they thought this would be a very interesting way to wage war in a new environment uh, post-World War II as it would allow the infrastructure to maintain its integrity. You wouldn't have to blow it up with a nuclear bomb. You would actually have uh, people decimated or, or, or uh, starving, and you'd be able to kind of wipe them out, and you would have all the infrastructure intact that, the, that you could use as the uh, victor uh, in a war. The Army, though, then, well, turns over control of Plum Island to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Why did that happen? Yeah, um, a few years into it, there was sort of this battle between the Joint Chiefs and the, and the war planners that uh, they were going in too many different directions. They were going in the direction of using uh, drugs for mind control. They were going in the direction of using 
germ agents. They were going in the direction of nuclear. And one of the, the, the uh, debates was resolved in, in favor of only going using germ warfare to kill human beings as opposed to make them starve or to go after food animals and to focus more on nuclear for nuclear destruction. And that precipitated the end of the Army's tenure of Plum Island and the Army with, uh, basically handed over Lab 257 and, uh, to the Department of Agriculture who uh, were then charged with the stewardship of the island. Did biological warfare research on Plum Island end then, however? Uh, no, it did not. Um, for many years there's a there's a, um, been sort of the, the public statement is that the Department of Agriculture did no germ warfare work, but in fact, you know, it doesn't take a scientist to recognize that a lot of the work at, that, that is performed there is, while they say it's a defensive in nature, it's there to defend against attack, any of the research that's of a defensive nature, it, figuring out how to replicate viruses and how to stop the replication of viruses is really offensive in nature because you're, you're figuring out how to strengthen or how to mass produce the materials and a lot of the materials are mass produced at Plum Island just so they can be studied. So that coupled with the idea that um, or the, really the fact that there, there were new, numerous documents showing that there were a lot of virus transmissions uh, in terms of shipments to and from Fort Detrick, Maryland which is the you know, acknowledged Army's germ warfare center and the agriculture scientists at Plum Island show that there was a very very close collaboration. Speaking of Newsday, uh, Newsday had a, oh, an article, uh, this is years later, about African swine fever, possibly from the agents, possibly from Plum Island, showing up in Cuba. Can you uh, get into that? Sure. Um, the, the issue there had to do with uh, Castro at one point um, it started saying that the United States had introduced biological agents into Cuba. And what happened in Cuba, there was uh, some famine for a while because the pigs, the swine, which is the primary food uh, animals there that are used for food animals, uh, were dying. And it turned out to be African swine fever. This is an ailment, um, really a virus, that has, had never previously appeared in the Western Hemisphere. The only other place that it had appeared or that it existed was Plum Island, where it was studied in you know mass quantities. And there's also information showing that there might have been shipments between um, Plum, the Plum Island Laboratory and Fort Dedrick, Maryland. And when you think that it's not really far-fetched to recognize that the United States government has engaged in um, not so overt means uh, to try to affect the Castro regime, I mean, one comes you know, comes to my mind is the, uh, you know, the the botulin toxin impregnated scuba suit that some operative handed Cuba, or the exploding cigar. Handed Castro. Yes, I'm sorry, handed the Castro, or the exploding cigar. Uh, you know, it doesn't uh, seem too far to think that some kind of a uh, shipment was made. And these were two Newsday reporters that uncovered they had some some leads that operat U.S. operatives dropped uh, these viruses or impregnated these. Uh, viruses into animals and it spread throughout the nation. It's not, it's not a far jump to recognize that it could have happened to try to either bring down or embarrass the uh, Castro regime. Department of Agriculture takes over. There have been some problems on Plum Island. There's been some, uh, some accidents. Can you describe uh, some of these mishaps? Sure, sure. Um, uh, uh, really a laundry list, if you will, a lot of it detailed in, in my book. Uh, uh, to begin with, um, there were blood testing of employees um, that were sort of anonymous and, and you know, I would ask them when well, we get, you get the documents and it says that, you know, a certain number of employees were found infected with African swine fever or found infected with Japanese encephalitis or something incredibly uh, dangerous to the public and uh, they're walking around with it but were they even informed of it and I couldn't get a straight answer from them not even sure if these employees even know, know or you know knew that at that time that they had been infected um, there was an actual outbreak of foot and mouth disease virus in 1978 where the uh, virus escaped the laboratory building and uh, somehow found its way into pens on the other side of the island where there were animals that were clean animals that were not infected, that they were showing signs of the disease. So there was a full-scale outbreak. They had to evacuate the entire island and burn everything. They had to basically spray everything on the island with lye, and they had to incinerate, you know, literally hundreds of animals over the next few days to try to contain it. But it was an actual outbreak, and it wasn't admitted 
by the uh, scientist on Plum Island and, uh, until it came out in the news media. Um, and then there was Hurricane Bob um, in the early 90s that, that hit head on Plum Island, knocked out Plum Island, Lab 257. Six employees were trapped inside the lab where a biological meltdown occurred. That's detailed in the book. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, you know, stolen laptops with sensitive biological. Uh, uh, test data were ju that had just been recovered. No one could fi you know, find them. There was a van that was stolen off Plum Island that was taken on the ferry, brought back to the mainland and found abandoned somewhere in Queens. No one knows what was in the van at the time. And uh, it's just sort of this, if you will, parade of horribles of a place that's terribly, terribly mismanaged. Stories of a, of a ferry where the package of viruses or the bacteria package, uh, styrofoam package that can float, obviously, falling off the back of the ferry somewhere between Orient Point and Plum Island Harbor, and knowing, you know, where it's just bobbing up and down, finding its way to some beach, who knows. And just at this point, I think one has to deal with the claim by the uh, federal government that your book is fairy tale, that it's uh, uh, not uh, credible. Right. And I think uh, they would add to that and they would say, it sounds more like science fiction than science. Well, unfortunately, in this case, uh, it's even scarier than science fiction because it's true. And, you know, there's not one fact or not one issue that I've raised in my book has actually been challenged uh, and, and, and proven to be not the case. And that sort of, that really speaks for itself. It's very easy to dismiss with platitudes and say, oh, it sounds like a fairy tale, it sounds like science fiction. But in fact, this is sort of the actual facts, the truth. You know, you can't lie when it comes to documents from the Environmental Protection Agency, a sister government agency of Plum Island, saying that this place is an environmental disaster, telling them to clean the place up and they don't clean it up, where they're flushing raw, biologically contaminated sewage into the Long Island Sound and into Gardner's Bay, and they're cited for it by, the, by their own federal government sister agency and uh, not doing anything about it, and then being targeted by uh, a terrorist in Kabul, Afghanistan, with ties to Osama bin Laden. Um, they're not fairy tales. Unfortunately, it's the truth. Let's talk about this Kabul-Afghanistan connection. In fact, your book opens with uh, that very, very scary issue. Yeah. The, you know, after September 11th, uh, I had been working on the book prior to that research, uh, it was really amazing to find out that this place is not just on the radar screen or people like myself that care about it uh, and, and changing it and making it better, but people that actually uh, want to see uh, a lot of harm done to us. And in this case, we're talking about uh, a person named Bashrudin Mahmood. He was a disaffected former Pakistani nuclear scientist. He set up a, a charitable organization in Kabul, Afghanistan. Turned out to be a terrorist front. Uh, during the war in Afghanistan, they raided the guy's uh, apartment and charitable office. They found all kinds of materials. They found information on uh, building anthrax uh, bombs and how to weaponize anthrax virus schematics on the actual bacteria and how to, how to replicate it. And they also found what my source called a uh, dossier. And inside the dossier was information on a place called the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. So here's a place where... Uh, you know, the people that I spoke to and scientists on Plum Island say, well, we don't think this place is any more dangerous than a federal courthouse. Well, um, I'm not sure how many federal courthouses are actually being targeted by terrorists in uh, you know, Kabul, Afghanistan, who have met with Osama bin Laden and Mullah Omar of the Taliban regime trying to create biological weapon, you know, weapons and devices. But uh, and I think this is something that we really got to take a look at. And what's most, most frightening to me is that this place has been targeted by terrorists. Targeted by terrorists? What actions have been taken by the federal government to protect the people? And there's millions of people who live in the proximity of, uh, of Plum Island. Very little. Very little indeed, Carl. Um, this is a place that in the 1950s, when it was run by the Army, really was pretty well protected. And that's what we talk about in this book. We say at the end of the day, what we're, not ask, what we're asking for is not um, uh, reflective of somebody who's not looking at it logically or unreasonable demands. We're just saying, let's take this back to the way it was protected in the 1950s. When the Army ran Plum Island, there were six armed guards in Jeep patrols patrolling the perimeter of Plum Island 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Today, it's, it's some kind of, uh, I think, cameras 
a combination of cameras and maybe some uh, uh, non-armed security guards. Um, it, it's very, very different. You know, cameras are just reactive. They're only going to react. Things will occur, and the camera's not going to be able to stop it proactively. Another thing is the way the viruses and the bacteria, the samples came into Plum Island. In the 50s, you'd have to bring, it could never be on the mainland. It would come from wherever it was abroad, Africa or Southeast Asia, by ship, and it would come alongside Plum Island, and there would be a little sort of tender that would come out from the, the harbor there and pick up the samples and bring them back. Today, they go over local roads, you know, uh, Connecticut, they come into, uh, you know, the, the, the airport up there or John F. Kennedy Airport, and they come on around the Long Island Expressway or I-91 in Connecticut. Local roads then on the east end of Long Island, no protection, just an unmarked, uh, you know, plane, uh, you know, who knows, Chevy Caprice Classic or something like that. Some nondescript car, there's no protection whatsoever. Sometimes they're even FedExed, and they're, they're left in this large, the oversized mailbox that sits right out there on the road uh, on 25, right, uh, right near the passenger ferry to Orient Point. Now, you, you speak in the book of the possibility of a, a seaborne attack by terrorists. Uh, also, the possibility, I mean, there's no no-fly zone over Plum Island. That's right. I mean, there was, that, that was one thing that there used to be, actually, again, in the 1950s, when the Army controlled the facility. Uh, it's, it's not restricted in any flight maps. Uh, you can have a scenario where there, there's actually an airstrip. Uh, there, it's an old World War II era uh, grassy field that you could just kind of fly into with a small plane. You could really, there's a number of ways that you could attack this island uh, very easily, unfortunately. And then there's the idea of just an accident. I mean, you could have somebody who's just taking a pleasure craft from Martha's Vineyard, Block Island, coming to East Hampton, and they have to make an emergency landing, or worse yet, crash landing. It could crash into the laboratory, emitting all kinds of uh, pathogens. And, and no one really knows how dangerous a place it is for them to stay away when they're flying aircraft. Another chapter in the book involves Lyme disease. Now, Lyme, Connecticut is just a, just a very few miles off uh, Plum Island, and you write about how they were uh, doing research involving ticks on Plum Island. That's right. That's right. I mean, the, the ties between... You know, every investigation is about connecting the dots. And when you look at Plum Island and Lyme disease, there are too many dots not to uh, assume that there's something there. Um, can't be proven, but the evidence certainly points, uh, points to uh, the need for an investigation scientifically. During the year in which the Lyme disease outbreak occurred, and it occurred in Old Lyme, Connecticut, in the mouth of the Connecticut River, nine miles away from Plum Island across the Long Island Sound, you have these tests going on on this disease called African swine fever virus. And what's being used to test this virus is ticks. So they're breeding what they call the tick uh, insectary. It was a tick colony where they were breeding hundreds of thousands of hard and soft ticks and, with, and then impregnating with these viruses and throwing them onto pigs in these test rooms. Problem is, is they're doing all these really tiny little tick, uh, these, 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 these experiments with these hundreds of thousands of tiny ticks in a laboratory that's about as good as a keeping viruses uh, contained as a piece of Swiss cheese. There are documents, they're reflected in my book, from the chief engineer of Plum Island at the time that talk about three-quarter inch holes in the laboratory's roof and in gaskets that have kind of wilt, wilted away and cracked and uh, just broke away over the years since the lab was formed by this you know, time in the early 70s, about 20 years into the lab's existence at this point. And you're talking about you know, hundreds or if not thousands of ticks or, or marching out side by side, let alone, let alone what kind of aerosols of, of pathogens into the air. I mean, the lab was porous. At the same time, you know, you, you, this is occurring, and you have the ability of a tick to get outside the building and onto a bird, and this is, you know, the east end of Long Island, this is what they call the North American flyaway, where, you know, millions of birds migrate up and down every year, and, and even locally, just bird transmission, there are over 100 species of birds identified in Plum Island, and many of them just hop right over to the next stop after Long Island Sound, which is the mouth of the Connecticut River, and there's Old Lyme. So it's really, it, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting, Carl, that no one had ever turned the, the magnifying lens, if you will, the, uh, the, the, on to Plum Island to say, maybe something happened here. There's been discussion through the years of Plum Island going to biosafety level four or staying at biosafety level three. Biosafety level four involves oh, a, a federal system of strict... Uh, Oh, a strict regulation concerning diseases for which there's 
no cure and there's no vaccine. What's the story with Plum Island and biosafety level three and four? Yeah, it's sort of a, a lot of confusion, and I, and, I, and I suspect it may be deliberate. Um, right now, Plum Island has researched on what they call level four germs, no vaccine, no cure. I can, know, I can name two of them right now, glanders, which was a bacteria uh, used in World War I by uh, the German army, the Kaiser, um, and uh, Rift Valley Fever, which uh, killed over a thousand people in 79 in Egypt, uh, which is sort of a viral hemorrhagic fever. The Rift Valley Fever is sort of the first cousin of the Ebola virus, kills very quickly, very rapidly, so essentially just you know, liquefies you and you start bleeding out of everywhere. It's a, it's a viral bleeding disease. Um, those two are level four germs and they've been studied at Plum Island in large quantities in what they would call a level three lab. Level four requires certain types of uh, body covering and spacesuits essentially um, to work on the pathogens, whereas three does not. Only requires negative air pressure and other devices that the lab currently has. But what's interesting is when people talk three or four, you're also talking about which types of pathogens, uh, germs are being used. And the understanding, I think, by the public is that only level three germs are studied there. That's not true. Some of the most dangerous germs known to mankind are studied at Plum Island. Please catalog some of these diseases. And also the issue of, uh, okay, they're animal diseases, but what about people? Sure. Well, that's, a, that's been sort of a big... Uh, uh, misnomer almost that they call this place the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Well, it's, you know, it, it is for research for animals that could be farm animals, but what happens is many of these diseases are zoonotic, meaning that they'll affect you and I the same way that they'll affect animals. Uh, again, Rift Valley Fever, as I mentioned, or is one of those that's considered a cattle disease. Well, it acts as violently as the Ebola virus. It's transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, it's, a, it's a clear uh, uh, a germ that's been targeted on the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention as a germ warfare agent. Glanders, same thing, known as a horse bacteria. Uh, there's other uh, viruses. One's called Japanese encephalitis virus. That's uh, very akin to the West Nile virus. It's an encephalitis transmitted by mosquitoes um, type of virus. Um, there are other strains of different viral uh, African swine fever, foot and mouth disease, um, things that really w you would think traditionally are affected and affect uh, uh, cattle plague, for example, they affect uh, uh, farm animals, but they also affect humans, and many of them with the same deadly effects, if not worse. What should be done about Plum Island? I mean, should it continue? Well, I, you know, it's a good question. I, I think that I don't know if Plum Island should continue, but I think that that we should continue uh, at a different location and perhaps in a, in a managed in a much, much, you know, far better way is the, the goals of Plum Island. If the goals of Plum Island with Homeland Security now taking, you know, it, um, control after September 11th, the goal of uh, protecting our homeland from biological attack, uh, then it ought to be done. And I, and I think there's a real need for that. Whether it should occur at Plum Island, a place that I think is long past its prime, a place where, you know, some 25 years ago, the National Academy of Sciences, the group of the largest, uh, uh, best scientific minds in the country, you know, wrote a report on Plum Island and said this place should be closed down immediately. And what do they do? They hire a new director. They spend millions of dollars of improvements to, to put a facade on the building to make it look nicer, and uh, they continue it. Um, you know, I, I, th I think that it, it, Plum Island probably has run its course, and I think that they've even publicly decided since the book has come out that they want to go elsewhere with it. Where is elsewhere? Um, they re right now, I think it's down to two sites, North Carolina and Kentucky. They're looking to site it there. Um, what's interesting is in both places, reporters and uh, community activists have picked up Lab 257, my book, and have read it and have used the information to sort of question the officials there. They have sort of the same stock answers like, oh, it's fairy tales and don't point to any fact uh, or try to dispute the fact that outbreaks have occurred or that people have gotten ill, which they have. Um, and they uh, use that information. They've invited me down there to join them uh, to kind of express to the community the mistakes and the mismanagement and the, and the poor handling of this place, Plum Island, for the last uh, you know, five decades uh, so that the mistakes cannot be repeated again. In terms of having it become a park like it originally was supposed to be or something else, 
that Lab 257, I mean, the specific Lab 257 itself have been, evidently is a problem yeah. of decontamination. Yeah, that's uh, sort of sad, ironic and sad twist to the end of the Plum Island Animal Disease Laboratory. Before they started the lab there, um, before they chose, Eric Traub chose this place for his germ warfare laboratory, um, there was some talk about the county, Suffolk County, taking it over, or the state, making it a beautiful park. I mean, this is an island that, you know, except for the laboratories, is, is a feral island. It's been in this uh, beautiful, pristine condition, uh, probably great for archaeology in some way, for American Indians. It's many, in many ways like its, its island neighbor, Gardner's Island. It's been, you know, relatively untouched since the, you know, early 1600s. Um, the sad part, though, the flip to that, why it may not happen, is that you have this Lab 257, this sort of ghost lab. If you look at it, you can see it on the south shore of the island if you're in a boat. It, it's, it's like a remnant from another era. And, and it was meant to be knocked down and, and, and the, you know, the, uh, all the concrete and the buildings hauled away, but they can't. The reason why they can is they've been unable to certify the building as biologically clean. They've gone in and put test strips down numerous times. They've tried to fog the place with disinfectant. And then when they take the test strips back into the laboratory and they try to see if they can grow anything, you hope that nothing grows, bacteria is growing. Uh, and that's a, it's evidence of the fact that the, the, the lab has not been fully cleaned biologically. So unfortunately, you have a situation where the building may just have to stay there and decay a biologically contaminated remnant of the island's germ warfare past. What should the government do, number one? Two, what should people do? Well, I think it's very easy. I think, number one, in terms of what the government should do is, and, and again, I say this in the book, and these aren't things that would be considered radical or out of the ordinary or unreasonable, because these are just simply the things that were, the, the, these are simply the, the ways in which Plum Island was uh, run and conducted in the 1950s when the army ran it. Bring back the army uh, guards or some kind of uh, uh, national guard patrol. This is a place that's been targeted by a terrorist. Let's get real. Let's face the facts. Let's put the six armed guards in the jeep patrols 24 hours a day. Is that really a lot to ask? Let's, let, let, let's, if we're going to drive these pathogens over our local roads, let's put them with someone who has an, you know, uh, an armed security person with them who is trained to deal with issues if someone wants to drive that car off the road to try to take that package. Or, for example, let's notify you know, appropriate uh, emergency first responders in case there is an accident. And that's actually occurred. One of these virus cars has had an accident once. Um, luckily, it was close enough to Plum Island that the first responders knew what the package was, and they were able to return it to Plum Island. Uh, thirdly, let's do something with that airspace. You know, this is something that needs to be blocked off on maps, and we need to uh, control it, and we need to keep people away from it and protect it, uh, because it is really and truly uh, an external threat. And we know that because it's been targeted. And people. What could people do? Oh, I'm sorry. People. That's a pretty easy uh, thing. People need to just basically speak up. Um, we've affected more change when 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 people, uh, you know, open their mouths and write letters to the editor and speak to local reporters and speak to elected officials and actually get out there and make real change. I mean, it's very simple. I would get that question a lot at book signings and at events, and it's very simple. It's just what you can do is you can read this book. You can understand the information that's in it. You can um, and act, on, act upon it. You know, let other people know this is what we're dealing with right in our own backyard, and this place needs to change. We asked the Department of Homeland Security to be involved in this program. No response. This has been a WVVH-TV special report. I'm Carl Grossman. Thanks for watching.